So to introduce her, Carrie O'Driscoll is a writer and mother of two living in the Pacific Northwest, joining us a little earlier in the morning than I am, so thanks for being here. Her work has appeared in print anthologies on mothering, reproductive rights, and cancer, as well as online outlets such as Miss Magazine, Parent Trap, The Manifestation, and Healthline. She's the founder of The Self Project, an organization whose goals are to help teenagers, teachers, and caregivers of teens recognize the unique challenges and amazing attributes of adolescence, and to use mindfulness and nonviolent communication to build better relationships. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass the spotlight to you, Carrie, and, and welcome, and um, here you go. Thanks for being here. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it so much. Um, it's been a challenge, to say the least, to have a book come out during this time. Um, so I had all these high hopes for different things I was going to do um, to promote the book and travel I was going to do and people I was going to meet. And um, obviously, the vast majority of that has not come to fruition, but it, it will. I will get on the road and do it again at some point. So because um, it is Mother's Day weekend, and um, because a, some of what I write about in this book is mothering and our ideas of mothering and what mothering meant to me, um, those are the passages that I've chosen to read. And my thought was um, that I would read something, I'll read a short passage, and then if anyone has comments or questions about that, we can sort of delve into that a little bit and then I'll do it again. And then I'll, the last passage that I have is a um, sort of a light and goofy passage because the themes of mothering in this book are a little fraught if you haven't read it. Um, I know a lot of people have complicated relationships with their mothers and I am absolutely no exception to that. So, um, I will, let's see, I'm gonna dive into the first part that I've highlighted here. Um, trying to think if I need to set anything up. Um, for folks who haven't, woo, sorry, for folks who haven't read the book yet, um, just a couple quick notes. Katie, when I talk about Katie, that's my younger sister who I actually did a great deal of mothering for when I was a kid. Um, Susan, was my dad's second wife. Um, so this passage is, I have been married for about four or five years and my in-laws are desperate to have me create a grandchild for them. And I'm kind of fighting against that in my head. <laughs> so I'm gonna dive into kind of the middle of this section. My relationship with motherhood is complicated. As a child, I rarely felt as though I had enough mothering and I was obsessed with finding it for myself and for Katie. Somehow I knew that it was a vital part of survival. At some point, I decided that mom needed mothering too. And I filled my own need for nurturing by becoming the nurturer. In a not altogether conscious way, I chose the role of mother as a way to get mothering for all of us. But it became clear to me pretty quickly that I wasn't doing it right. And I began resenting everything that motherhood stood for. In my own attempts to fix things for Katie and mom, I was fully aware that I was making shit up as I went. I felt completely incompetent and unprepared, fueled by fear more than anything. And I came to believe that all mothers were flying by the seat of their pants. And still, I craved it. I saw it as one of the most important things a human could have. I wanted it more than anything for myself. I did it for Katie because I was certain she wouldn't survive without it. And I did it for mom because I thought I could somehow remind her what to do and how to do it. Despite my desperate desire for mothering, when I was given opportunities to be taken care of, I struggled to trust it. 
I had seen how mothering could be there one minute and gone the next. I pushed against my mom's occasional attempts to care for me as if to test her resolve, and she let me push her away entirely. When Susan stepped in to help, like the time I woke her up in the middle of the night because I had fallen out of the top bunk and gouged my head on the corner of the desk, it felt surreal. She didn't yell at me or complain. She simply led me to her bathroom and gently washed the blood away with hydrogen peroxide, examined the gash in my head, and patched it up gently. I still remember how soft and warm her hands were and how we joked that I might have a blonde streak in my hair for the summer from the peroxide. But maybe it was because it was midnight or because I was fiercely loyal to my mom. I never really let myself believe that I could be mothered by Susan. And so I didn't let it happen. And yet mothering is in my DNA. For all of my anger toward mom for not being the kind of mother I thought she should be, she had a reputation for taking care of other people. She married a man who told her he had terminal cancer in order to make the remaining years of his life comfortable. She was often on the phone with girlfriends who struggled with defiant children or angry husbands or women who had just lost a job. She was a waitress with a loyal following because she remembered just how people liked their coffee and always make sure, made sure they had enough water. And they knew she really wanted them to have a good experience. Her real estate practice was focused on women in transition, serving those who were newly divorced or widowed or were in need of honest advice. She was as much social worker as listing agent. Her sisters are all nurturing, caring, empathetic souls who would give you the shirt off their back, no questions asked. It's a family tradition to take care of other people. But as I got older and more tired and increasingly resentful, I decided mothering was something to be avoided. I became actively disdainful of anyone who tried to mother me. I armored myself by telling myself I didn't need it anymore. I wasn't weak enough to need it. My motivations to have an abortion at 17 were many but one of the most visceral reactions I had when I realized I was pregnant was horror at the thought that I would never break free of mothering if I continued that pregnancy. I would be mothering my boyfriend and the baby indefinitely. My avoidance of mothering worked for years. I aligned myself with my brother who didn't need me to mother him. I finally broke up with my boyfriend and began dating Sean whose mother had done her job just fine I actively chose jobs that put me in roles where I took care of other people, tutoring, medical assisting, counseling, but I rationalized those things because they were transactional and not survival based. None of the people I helped would ever mistake me for their mother, but maybe I was fulfilling my genetic mothering destiny by finding a different way to take care of other people without actually being a mother. I could act that way without all the emotional weight or responsibility it entailed. All right. So I don't know if folks have questions or thoughts on that, if that resonates with anybody or if it's vastly different from anybody else's experience. Um, but I would love to hear from you if you have thoughts about that passage. Beautiful. You're an amazing writer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Trace. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, I really resonated with it. Um, I, I had a question that came up when, when you had the gash and Susan helped you. I didn't know how old you were and I assumed it was rather young, but I just wonder, um, I wondered about that, your age and um, when she came into your life, kind of, because I, I guess because I don't know the whole book, um, that just was a curiosity. Yeah, so um, Susan married my dad when I was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, that incident happened when I was in the sixth grade, so I would have been about 12. Um, and she was very, she was almost the polar opposite of my mom. Um, and 
And I fought her for a really, really long time, not only in that sort of traditional way that you like fight a stepmother because you don't want her to replace your mom, but also um, she had a son from a previous marriage and she had been a single mom for a really long time. And I think she was delighted to have a daughter figure. Um, and so she really tried. She was very nurturing and loving with me. Um, and she was incredibly patient. And that was something that I wasn't um, prepared for or used to. And so it was really a challenge for me to accept the gifts that she offered to me. Um, she and my dad ended up getting divorced when I was a senior in high school. And she and I still, I, she's one of my best friends on the planet. She actually was my maid of honor at my wedding, which didn't make my dad super happy. But <laughs> um, in time, I, I came to accept the gifts that she offered me. I think because she was just consistent. She over and over again. It didn't matter how many times I pushed her away. My mom let me push her away and my mom gave up and Susan never gave up. And that's not an indictment of my mom because I was pretty hateful to my mom. Yeah. Um, but Susan was just there. She was just always there and she still is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's nice. That's good, good to hear. Um, Sharon, your question, and it, just in case folks can't see the chat, um, Sharon says, do you think your aversion to motherhood is based on anger against your mother or something deeper? Um, I think both. I think, um, you know, I, I really believe that families create patterns and, and if we don't consciously break those patterns, um, then we're kind of almost destined to repeat them. And my mom was not mothered well. She was the oldest daughter and um, her mom had some severe back problems and um, had back surgery. I think when my mom was in junior high and got sort of addicted to the pain medications and my mom became the caregiver for her four younger siblings. Um, and then my mom was not addicted to anything, but she became incredibly depressed when I was about eight years old and I became the mother. And I think, so I think there's this sort of family cycle, this family history um, that, that had a lot to do with it. I think some of my aversion to motherhood actually came out of what, what we expect from mothers and what we don't expect from fathers. And growing up in the 1970s and 1980s, that was, um, you know, it was women's lib, right? And, and I was very much resentful of um, the expectations that were placed on mothers and how you, you know, the, you, the people would say you can have it all, but having it all for mothers meant doing it all. And to me, that, um, that felt like a choice to abbreviate my own choices and my own life. And I was not willing to do it. So I think there were a lot of things that went into my aversion to motherhood. Spoiler alert, um, if you haven't read the book, I am a mother. I actually do have two children. <laughs> so I, can't, I overcame my aversion to mothering. Um, Chris, did your own motherhood of your two girls heal the gaps left by your own mother? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I made a very deliberate choice to have children and I may have made very deliberate choices all along to do things in a very intentional way so as to not recreate those patterns for my kids. Um, I have happened to have two daughters and have been um, having the, the relationship that I have with them where I let them be children as long as I possibly could and where um, I didn't lean on them emotionally the way that my mom leaned on me emotionally was incredibly healing. It gave me a completely different perspective and 
And it also gave me a lot of compassion for my mom. I mean, mothering is so incredibly difficult and single mothering is that times a million. And so um, the, the biggest part of it for me was mothering with mindfulness really became so healing. So that I'm very grateful that at some point my somewhere my psyche said, yeah, we get that, you know, intellectually you think mothering is horrible, but you should maybe do this anyway. <laughs> so, um, all right, I'm going to do Joanne's question and then I'm going to read a little bit more. Um, thank you, Jerda. Um, I appreciate your kindness and you too, Tracy. Um, Joanne's question is, what were some of the joys of writing the memoir and what were some of the sticking points? Um, if I'm being honest, I didn't set out to write a memoir. When I started this project, I was actually writing about other women and their lives. Um, and I went to a writing workshop in Portland so that I could really work on that project. And I had, it was taught, just happened to be taught by a memoir writer, Jennifer Lauk, who has three New York Times bestseller um, memoirs. First one is Blackbird. Um, and she, we all had to read aloud and it was a very small workshop. And she just drilled me on the first day. And she said, yeah, this is all really interesting, but we need you to write about you. And, and I was like, mm, yeah, that's not really my shtick. And she was like, mm, I think it is. And she, that weekend, got stuff out of me that I never wanted to remember. And, and she just kept saying to me over and over and over again for the next few years, write the thing you don't want to write. Write the thing you're most afraid to write. And I really, um, I dropped the F-bomb on her a lot. <laughs> If we're, if we're being honest, um, I was very angry with her. So um, the sticking points were the things that were the scariest. They were the things where I had to confront making the people that I was angry with three-dimensional human beings. I couldn't, where I couldn't just say, oh yeah, my mother was a horrible person and my dad was a horrible person too. And there were, here was this other horrible person. Like I had to, I had to examine who these people really were and and find not excuses but compassion and understanding and a deeper a deeper knowledge that um you know being in relationship with these people was a choice and i could choose not to do it um or I could choose to do it, but if I was going to do it, it had to be real. Um, so that those were the sticking points. Those were the hard. Those were the really hardest parts. The the joys. The biggest joys were when I started to see the patterns. I don't know if you can all if you can see this. My tattoo. There's this. If you've read the book, this tattoo has to do with the very last section, and it's really sort of the my understanding of my own personal evolution and how every time you think you're right back where you were last time you're actually not so in you know i'm circling back around but i'm not i'm not here i'm here right i'm i'm one step higher and i've got this breadth of experience and wisdom that i didn't have last time i made it right there um so for me that was the joy like being able to like connect some dots and see, have this bigger understanding. Um, if you may notice that in the book, there are three different sections in the book and some of the title, chapter titles repeat over time. And that's really in keeping with the spiral of like, oh, here I am again in this place, but wait, I'm not, I'm up here. So for me, that was the biggest joy was feeling, it felt purposeful, it felt, um, like forward motion. It felt like evolution. And it also felt really healing. It was, it was a beautiful thing to be able to um, feel like I was growing. And 
and I can pass some of that growth on. Okay, so this next part is one of these, one of the chapter titles that that repeats called evolution. And this one is in the third um, section. My mom um, has had early onset Alzheimer's. She is still alive, but she's currently on hospice. Um, and she's um, I mean, this was maybe three years in where, where things were starting to get really tough. Um, and she lives about four hours away from me, four hour, four hour drive away from me. And so we used to talk on the phone all the time. So that's a little background. Um, the only other background I think is when I say Erin, that's my oldest daughter. So here's the next part. Mom. Will you untangle my necklace for me? I need to wear it today. Erin thrusts a silver mess into my hands and whirls into the bathroom to dry her hair. Rather than being annoyed at this task, I am pleased. I am good at this. It's one of the odd things I can do with ease. Slowly and methodically pulling the links through each other to loosen the knots is zen-like. Even as a kid who had a hard time sitting still, this was one thing I excelled at. Using my long fingernails to gently tease the strands loose from each other, I wonder if this is something Aaron and Lauren will remember one day, my odd ability to undo knots in necklaces and bracelets. What do I remember my mom for? Two things instantly come into focus in my mind, chili and lasagna. I feel guilty. I should be able to think of something more than that. I call mom every few days to check in and she is always thrilled to hear from me. At this point, she still recognizes my voice, although she is sometimes sure I am her sister, Carrie. She doesn't have a sister named Carrie and I am grateful. Today when I call, I'm struggling with an issue at work and I ask her if I can vent. Sure, tell me what's happening. She perks up, and I suddenly remember the part of her life where she sold real estate for 30 years. As I rant about the situation I find myself in with a business partner who is trying to convince me to do something I'm not comfortable with, something magical happens. Mom makes all the right noises in all the right places. When I lament that I think the entire deal will soon crumble, I recall all the sales mom worked on for weeks at a time that fell apart for one reason or another. How did you handle that? Did it make you crazy to work so hard for so long on something and have the other real estate agent just screech to a halt or sabotage the deal? God, that must have been hard. Hmm, I suppose it must have been. I don't remember. But you stick to your guns, Carrie. You can't let this deal happen if you don't feel good about it. You deserve to have it happen just the way you want it to. Don't let him bully you. Thanks, Mom. It is frustrating, but you're right. I have to hold firm boundaries. Thank you for letting me dominate the conversation and vent. Oh, honey, thank you. You just made my day calling to talk to me. Call and vent anytime. I love hearing from you. We hang up and I am struck by the changes mom has gone through. For most of my life, she was a card carrying expert in Catholic guilt who could sling a backhanded compliment like nobody's business. More times than I care to count, I have been on the receiving end of something that on paper looked like a proud mama observation, but in real life delivered in a sarcastic tone was actually a biting commentary on my life or my personality. But in the last year, she has become increasingly gracious and grateful. Over the past two decades, our rare phone conversations all ended with her saying, okay then. But these days, she does everything she can to extend our phone calls, and she always remarks on how happy she is to hear from me. She ends every conversation with, I love you, and asks when I can come visit her again. All of this has prompted a change in me too. 
I genuinely hope that she has been released from all the memories she doesn't want to have. For so many years, I longed to take her by the hand and lead her to the stinking pile of misery I had so carefully cataloged. I wanted to present her with incontrovertible evidence of the times when I needed her and she pretended not to notice or turned it around to prove that she needed me more. I wanted to show her something that would make her admit that I wasn't crazy, that things actually were as bad as I thought they were. But what I know now is that pile is mine. It's not hers. If she has a pile, I hope that it has been swept away from her mind, just like the name of her favorite restaurant or the company she used to work for. I hope that her thoughts these days are peaceful and amused and that she isn't beating herself up for things she did or didn't do. I begin to realize that taking care of someone doesn't have anything to do with my idea of what is best. All those years I worked to take care of mom and protect her feelings, what I was really doing was taking care of myself. With Katie, I was desperate to keep her from feeling any pain or acting in a way that would get her sent away, and that was self-protection. I take care of my daughters to keep them safe, to turn them into what I think a good human being is, and to show my love for them as though it will somehow reflect on me. There has always been some sort of ego boost I get from making things neat and tidy, satisfying the essentials, checking off the boxes. And it gives me a sense of control and predictability in my life. But that isn't truly what taking care of others is all about. It is much more profound and impactful for me to set aside my values and assumptions and just love mom and Katie and my girls and meet them where they are. It is harder to be sure. It is more nebulous and far less predictable. And there's always a chance I will be asked to do something I don't want to do. But there is also a grace and a freedom in it. It allows me to let down my guard and just listen and hold space. It both makes me feel less frantic and responsible for them and more connected and affectionate. If I am not responsible for fixing anything, I am not worried about falling short of anyone's expectations. As my mom's memories peel away, I begin to have space for other memories. Beyond the stories I've told myself over the years about who she is and the episodes I've highlighted that support that narrative, there is so much more. As I sit down to design eighth grade graduation cards for my youngest daughter and her closest girlfriends, I pick up a calligraphy pen and realize it was mom that taught me to do this. I remember her fastidious attention to lining the letters up on the page making sure that the entire message would fit before she put the nib to the parchment. She was recruited to fill the names in on certificates of all kinds when I was a kid because her calligraphy skills were so beautiful. I remember excursions to Crater Lake after dad left when she taught us to cross country ski. My image of her is expanding as she and I both shed old ways of relating along with her short term memory. My mind is wired to look for danger, to find gaps and errors. The challenges I faced as a kid created superhighways in my brain that taught me that the world was a scary place and I had to be on guard all the time. Those superhighways carry me from observation to expectation of disaster with no off ramps. But if I'm going to make room for happiness, I have to start finding alternate routes. I resolved to start looking for the things that are good and right in my world, paying attention to people treating others with kindness and compassion, exploring possibilities for peace and connection and really appreciating them. In the beginning, it feels trite and Pollyanna-ish, but I have to keep trying if I'm going to make it work. I also begin looking for examples in my own life where people cared for me in a way that was meaningful and profound because I'm pretty sure that most of my life, my idea of taking care of someone was a bit off the mark. All right, does anybody have thoughts or questions? 
I love seeing all your faces <laughs> or your names. Jarda, I see your name. It's very sweet. Carrie, um, am I speaking? Yep. Just I'm here. I really appreciated um, just the my visceral response to you discussing um, being able to just be present and to hold that space and not worry about fixing or problem solving or um, you know just meeting that expectation up and beyond and just being present because I'm imagining that you know I, I know your daughters and I know you're an amazing mother. And you and I talk a lot about our mother and challenges that um, that is the gift that we can give now our adult daughters is to just listen and be present. And thank you for reaffirming that. Um, it's very timely <laughs> with my <laughs> adult daughter home. <laughs> my mother-in-law's laughing <laughs> because those are the moments that, that actually I... <laughs> Yes, she knows. She knows. We've had our I challenge. I promise not to write about it. <laughs> <laughs> but to you actually. That's what pseudonyms are for, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. But um, thank you. And I, and I am, you know, I'm so excited. I've, I've, I'm treating myself. I have come. I've, my mother-in-law read this, and it's now my turn. And I'm so happy because I need this. Um, everything you're you're talking about is very affirming mm -hmm. and um your discovery of that and then being able to verbalize and in written expression um something i'm really looking forward to it's it's a much needed uh gift i will give myself <laughs> so yeah. thank you yay no you're right i mean i think you know that's one of the things we that's another part of our sort of cultural expectation of mothers is that they'll fix everything that they'll you know smooth the path that they'll make everything okay um and you know sadly i mean obviously there are certain things that do need to be fixed right there are very concrete things that we need to take care of for our kids um but when i had that realization that the most kind, the most profound kind of caretaking has nothing to do with checking off boxes or, you know, fixing a meal for someone or, you know, it was huge. It was massive for me. Um, and I think the gift that it gives to our kids is the message that they can release themselves from that too, you know? Um, some, some things can't be fixed. And some things don't need to be fixed. Sometimes, you know, like we, now we can't fix this. We, we can't fix this coronavirus pandemic, you know, insanity. We have to just sit with it. And that doesn't mean we can't do anything, but there's something so profound about just being there for someone as a witness, you know, to hold, helping them, just holding space and, and helping them be okay with where they are right now. I mean, I think fixing, fixing, fixing is constantly sending the message that there's something wrong with you. You're broken, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, what is it that you need right now? And in my mom's case, um, a lot of times it was just somebody to sit with her she was so confused and and so scared and i think that um having that presence was just so comforting and then for me again like i said in that piece you know it sort of allowed me to let down my guard and take my ego out of the equation and just recognize that sometimes that's enough sometimes that presence is enough um, so Chris asked, what kind of work did it take to move out of the role of fixer? It took a lot of work. It took an awful lot of work and it took work in sort of from lots of different directions. Um, I have to say the first thing that happened when I noticed that 
a lot of the caretaking I was doing was really feeding my own ego was work around shame because I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified that that, at the notion that that, like, am I a narcissist? Am I, you know, it, it, so I had to really work through, you know, no, I do, I do care for my sister. I do care for my mother. I do have this, you know, positive regard for them and this genuine wish that they are healthy and happy. And so it was also feeding my ego and it was also allowing me to feel like I was in control of something. Um, there was a lot of unpacking that had to happen there. Um, but also I think that, you know, being able to embrace that freedom of, <laughs> oh, guess what? I don't have to fix this. Like all you're asking me for, I have this shorthand that I created with my girls when they were in middle school where, you know, they'd get in the car after school and instantly launch into some horrible thing that happened during the day. And my first instinct was always like, tell me who to talk to about the, you know, I get, would get all mama bear and my girls would get furious with me, mom, stop it, knock it off. And, and so I finally started asking, I created this little shorthand with them and where I would be like, okay, I need you to tell me what hat I'm wearing right now. And we called it the AOV. Do you want advice? Do you want my opinion? Or are you just venting? Like you, you tell me which of those things you need from me and I'll put that hat on. And 99% of the time they would say, I'm just venting. And then it was like, oh, okay, I can chill. <laughs> like all I have to do is listen, this is really awesome. Every once in a while they can get to the end of it and they would say, okay, I want your opinion. You don't tell me what to do, but I want you to tell me like, was it okay for me to be this upset about this? Or what do you, you know, would you have been mad about this? Um, but that, really shifted for me that was a big shift for me from the fixing where now you know a lot of times i'll go into a situation with someone who um you know is really upset about something or they've come to me to you know tell me about something and and i'm wired now to say you need to tell me what you need from me if you need me to be an ally or an advocate if you need me to amplify your voice that's cool if you need me to just be here and hold space for you I'm on it. And, and it is, it's a, it's a great, it's a beautiful thing. I totally love it. <laughs> it makes my life so much easier. Um, thank you, Jerda. Thank you, Susan, for your kind, kind words. I love seeing you. Hi, Jerda. Um, Kathy Collins. I have observed that children of the chronically ill often have impaired mothering skills. Do you think that imply, applies to your mother? Um, I mean, the thing about my mom's mom was outwardly, she didn't seem chronically ill. She seemed, she was a fifth grade teacher and she was, you know, a coach and she was really physically active and, um, so I think that, I think that was sort of the mind mess for my mom. There was this whole gaslighting thing that went on of like, you know, hey, your mom's this amazing person. And it was the same thing with me where people would be like, wow, your mom's such a dynamo. You know, she's working three jobs and she's raising kids and she's, you know, always so positive and happy and she's super supportive of everybody else. And then you have this disconnect of like, I know what this person is like at home. <laughs> and that's great that you think my mom's awesome not my experience. Um, I think that's what happened with my mom was, was this, that disconnect, that sort of constant gaslighting of, and, and again, this is not an indictment of my grandmother. It's not an indictment of my mother. It's, I think it's this cultural thing. We still do this thing where we don't, we don't let anybody outside see what our actual lives are like and what our difficulties are. Um, you know, we don't ask for help in, in ways that are sort of broadcast to other people. We, we have a really hard time not feeling shameful about that. And so um, I think that's starting to change, thankfully. But um, again, I think it's tied up with those expectations, the cultural expectations that we have of mothers. And 
um, the cultural expectations we have of fathers, which are very, very different things. So I think, I think that's what happened to my mom. I think she, I think she tried to hold it together as much as she possibly could. There was a lot of trauma. If you haven't read the book, um, there were some really incredibly difficult things that happened when I was a kid. And I understand fully why my mom was as depressed as she was now. Back then I just wanted her to be my mom and there was nothing she could say that could justify it to me. So, and on that note, I'm gonna read this last piece because this was sort of, this was the one humorous part in the book. Um, and this was one of the last phone calls I had with my mom. Um, Cause then she couldn't understand the phone. She couldn't understand the, like, why is there this, I have to hold this thing up to my head and why is there a voice coming from it? And it just scared the crap out of her. Um, so this is um, our, my version of our Abbott and Costello last phone conversation we had. The day has gotten away from me. I meant to call mom this morning because she's always more confused in the afternoon, but I have to call now. It's been nearly a week since I checked in. I snap the leash on the dog and head out with my phone. Hello? She always answers the phone on the first ring. Hey mom, it's Carrie, how are you? I always announce myself in case she doesn't recognize my voice anymore. I'm fine. She's a little cautious. I'm not sure she knows who I am, but she's playing along. So what's up, anything new with you? That's exactly what Ken wants to know. He just got home from work and caught me lying on the bed in our room. I have a nasty headache and I was trying to get rid of it by taking it, you know, whatever you want to call it. A nap? Is that what you call it when you're trying to get rid of a headache? Well, yeah, unless you mean taking an Advil. I know what an Advil is, thank you very much. Ooh, sarcasm. That's good. She's still in there somewhere. But the other thing, when you lay down, a nap, that's what I call it. I should let you go so you can go back and lay down. She sighs, no, it's fine. You called. And the cat just came and jumped on me. So I don't think I'll be taking a, not Advil, but that other thing right now. Are you sure? You can just push the cat off of you and go to sleep. There's no way she can sleep with this cat on her. She would suffocate under his weight. I'm having trouble believing he jumped up on the bed by himself. This cat looks like Jabba the Hutt with fur. No, I can't push the cat off. That would be mean. And Ken is home and you are on the phone. Maybe I don't need a whatever you call it. A nap. Did you take any Advil? I know what Advil is. I wasn't taking one when you called. I was taking the other thing or trying to. I know, mom. I'm nearly in hysterics. The dog has taken a dump on the neighbor's lawn and he's using all of his 70 pounds to drag me forward while I squat with a plastic bag on my hand and try to clean it up, my flat phone tucked precariously between my shoulder and ear. Sometimes taking an Advil and a nap makes my headache go away. I say, your headache? Do you have a headache? You sound like you're outside. You should go in. Is it bright outside? That can make it worse. Oh God, now I have the giggles. No, mom, I don't have a headache. You do. I know that. I'd have to be nuts to not know that I have a headache. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I was just trying to be helpful. By having a headache with me? That's crazy. I want her to be teasing me but she isn't. She is absolutely genuine in her confusion. Strangely, instead of freaking me out, it's cracking me up. Never mind. Tell me what you've been doing lately. Trying to lie down and get rid of this headache? All right, I'll let you go then. You go lie down, I'll call you tomorrow. But maybe take an Advil before you nap. What is it with you and the Advil? Why are you so pushy? I just wanted to lie down and do that other thing we talked about. Okay, okay, you do that. I'll call you tomorrow. She heaves a huge sigh. Okay, that sounds good. The next day. I love you.
I kind of like that our last phone conversation was ridiculous and irreverent like that. It kind of is a, it's a really good thing because my mom had a pretty good sense of humor. Um, and I was always impressed by her ability to kind of describe things as a workaround when she couldn't remember a word. She used to, I remember one time calling her and, and I think it, this is in the book where she was trying to describe what the weather was and she said there was water falling from the sky. And I was like, that's so cool. <laughs> Go mom, I'm so glad you thought of an alternate way. Um, all right, Sharon has a question. I have friends who were pretty damaged by their relationships with their mothers and needed years of therapy. Ooh, do you think there are women who shouldn't become mothers? Um, I hate the word should, and I, don't, I would never use it with anybody else. So um, I will, that's my first caveat. Um, Deciding to be a mother is an incredibly, incredibly personal decision. Um, it's an incredibly lonely decision, um, especially in our culture where you might have a partner now, but you're not guaranteed you're going to have a partner to raise that child forever, um, monetarily or otherwise. Um, I was terrified to become a mother because of the damage that I'd had. And I'm glad I waited as long as I did. I'm also really, really glad that I had the opportunity to terminate a pregnancy when I was 17 years old. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that that's something that's just incredibly personal for every person. I, I think that mothering is something that is so important and it goes so far beyond having a biological child. Um, I mean, I have been mothered by friends. I have been mothered by my stepmom. I've been, you know, to me, mothering is not necessarily you know, a parent child thing. Um, and I think that if you choose not to have children, you still can be a mother figure in someone's life. And I think you can do that in a really impactful way. I think for all parents though, and frankly, all educators too, it is incumbent upon us to unpack our own garbage before we interact with young people because we can cause so much harm. Um, so I think, you know, it's not only, it's not only about us, it's not only about doing our own work to heal ourselves, but it's about doing our own work to not inflict damage on other people. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, something that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and then Chris, I second that question from Sharon and also wonder if someone feels like mothering is something they're meant to do, but are single and aging. Do I recommend single motherhood? You know what? Um, it's hard. It's incredibly hard. And if you have a tribe of people that are willing to support you and help you nurture your child, and you know give you breaks and so that you're able to not lose yourself in the mothering if you want to be a mother be a mother i mean find as much support as you possibly can from other people that you trust from other people who've done their work from other people that you know will love your child with absolute unconditional positive regard and you know what, single parenting is absolutely doable. It's exhausting, it's relentless. It is, um, if you can't tap out every once in a while, it's ridiculously overwhelming. But if you have a tribe of people that you know love your 
child and love you. I mean, being a mother is, is the most important thing I've done in my whole life. So, I mean, I think if you have the support, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for affirming Chris as an educator. <laughs> yes, 100% doing our work as educators. Yeah, my daughters had some teachers that hadn't done their work and really caused some challenges, really made things hard. Um, and, and it's hard. It's, you know, we don't have access to good mental health, I don't think. When your mental health treatment is dependent on you having a job and enough money to pay a copay. That's, that's not accessibility, sadly. <laughs> so, all right. I want to hear from somebody who has had like ridiculously goofy, happy experience with their mom, even if it was a Abbott and Costello routine. <laughs> Tracy, I know you probably have had goofy experiences with your mom and probably even with Mary since she's been living in your home, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. But I, I want to just say that um, I, I, it's, I feel like mothering has been um, an incredible uh, growth experience. I call it the people expanding machine, all of that. But being a daughter to um, an older mother, having an adult relationship with my mom and with my mother-in-law has also been people expanding um, and learning the fine art of being mindful and being present. Um, something, sorry, it's gonna choke me up. <laughs> something that's absent from our fast paced life. So oh, yes. having Mary here is, I believe, really helped us all slow down and do the crossword puzzle. <laughs> slow down and talk about... I had to slow down too. Right, right. And, and I know that um, as challenging as COVID is for our older parents, my Mary's 87, my mother's 80, 80 and my father's 81, um, it's taught us all to savor uh, that which is in front of us. Because, I'm, yes, yes. I'm, I'm laughing. One of the things that I've been trying trying to teach is new, new swear words. <laughs> oh no, goodness. <laughs> learning, learning how to express frustration. <laughs> yeah, are you a little tired of, she's, she's been exposed to 20 years of age and 17 years of age. And we've talked about dropping some of those descriptive swear words, but um, I think that it's an opportunity to appreciate once again in a different part of the life cycle the gifts that are there and i love your term carrie mindful yeah. mindful mothering mindful parenting mindful yeah. people skills yeah. and 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 not worrying about all we have to do all the time um and i'm still learning that i'm going to be a work in progress for a long long time I'm wondering we all are i mean we were probably if he's and, doing all right yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we were we were programmed to not be mindful. I think. Yeah. Um, it's it's definitely a work in progress. The best part though is when your kids can turn it back on you when they're old enough to be like, <laughs> I don't think you heard what you just said to me. You might want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me let me just take that in. So, but Carrie, thank you. Um, just so important, I believe, to have these conversations and to affirm that those places where we feel a little uncomfortable, where it's not natural, that's where our growth is. That's, that's where our work is. And, and I appreciate that boost of inspiration. Um, again, very timely, mm -hmm. given our week, given our experiences, um, and heading into Mother's Day tomorrow. A yeah. beautiful way to embrace that. Um, and I'm looking at the questions, and I'm the one who said that's a big question. If I feel like I never would have assessed myself to be a good mother, but I show up every day and I do the best I can. And I believe that somewhere along the line, that's, that is really what we're meant to do is, and I loved what you said about even taking on 
the challenge and adventure of single, single parenting, single motherhood. Um, if we if we are available to love and expand, then we will be a good mother, a good parent. Um, and I, again, I, I'm inspired to try to do that every day. <laughs> Show up and um, and grow with the experience. So, thank you. Thanks. Mrs. Perry, she just she just checked on her son. Jeff's taking the fence down right now, <laughs> so we, we had to make sure he was alive. <laughs> Yeah, and good shoes on, wouldn't hurt his feet. He's 60. <laughs> yes, we're old. <laughs> All right, we're going to mute ourselves so somebody else can talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Trace. Thank you, Mary. Well, it's just about two o'clock, and um, I just wanted to say one thing. Well, if you've got any last minute questions, you can drop them in the chat box. But, Carrie, you know, what I kept hearing throughout this whole reading and the discussion, which is awesome, is um, the power in writing difficult stories. Like, like you've said, no one, you know, we don't really want to approach those scary stories, but in doing that, um, you know, you do, you, that's the only way we can figure out what is the core of who we are, whose mess, like you said, whose, whose pile of mess it is, and um, be able to work through those memories. And you know, um, I always think about like, how do you write through difficult stories? And um, sometimes you just do it. Sometimes it's distance. Sometimes it's, um, you know, kind of like what you alluded to, taking a look at a situation from that other person's perspective to find that bit of compassion that helps you move through that story. So I really appreciate that because I think that's so important in what we do in life and in writing. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I don't know if there's any other last minute questions before we close. It doesn't look like it. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. It's, I know in a lot of places, especially here, it's a gorgeous day outside. So I appreciate you coming and hanging out and and chatting with me and Jared, uh, I'm going to give you a huge hug to being an alternate mother to both of my children for at least a year of their lives. <laughs> it was magic that they got to have you as a teacher. I'm so pleased. And um, thank you for the folks who've read the book and passed it on to other people. And um, if you haven't read it, there's a lot more in there. It's not just themes of mothering. Um, there are other themes in there too. And, and Christy, thank you so much for doing this. I, um, like I said, it's been a challenge to have a book come out with a small press during this time and seeing the writing community and the independent press community come together and support each other and do all these really fun, innovative things has been just so awesome. Um, and Chris Moore, who's on this call also, she has an amazing podcast where she interviews women writers, a lot of whom um, are with indie presses. So check out her podcast. It's called The Situation and the Story. Um, and she's got some really fun interviews on there with folks. So I, anybody who needs another book to read, check out her, her podcast. Um, and then Christy's... Um, blog too where you've got some great stuff from writers on why they write mm -hmm. so um if yeah. you're looking for more books in fact jareda the the one ruby christy remind me her name or her last name again ruby ruby mcconnell ruby mcconnell okay jareda you will love that book um her book um she's from oregon and she's a scientist in She's written about a memoir that I think you would really love. Oh. So, all right. Thank you. I'm going to let you all go on with your day. But thank you, Moss, thank you so much for being here. And Yep. Thank I, you, Carrie. Thank you for being a part of the series. And um, you'll be able to find this recording on our YouTube channel if you want to take a look at it again later or share it. And uh, please go on hiddentimberbooks.com and check out the next readings we have coming up, which is this next weekend, it's a whole uh, YA weekend. We've got two authors, one on Saturday, Beth Kephart, and one on Sunday, Gila Green. So I'm super excited about that as well. And I loved having you here, Carrie. I loved the discussion. Um, 
and thanks everybody for supporting small presses.